We're going to talk about ulcerative colitis here on the exam room today, and we're going to be joined in just a moment by someone who suffered through ulcerative colitis and perhaps even reached a point where they felt despair, like nothing would ever get better for them. They can never rid themselves of those uncomfortable, painful symptoms. But my guest today actually did that. How did she do that? Well, let's welcome Debbie to the exam room, and we're going to get her story right now. Debbie, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Not glad to be here. <laughs> I'm glad that you're here too, because this is the very first time that we have spoken with somebody who has had ulcerative colitis and really seen a dramatic improvement here on the show. It's come up a time or two uh, when we've had gastroenterologists on, especially Dr. Will Bolsowitz. Uh, he and I have talked about it a little bit, but never from a patient perspective. So how long ago was it that you were first diagnosed with ulcerative colitis? I was diagnosed July of 1990. I was 23 years old, so I'm almost 55. It was 31 and a half years ago. And I suffered for many years, and then I became plant-based. All right. And I've been doing great. All right. So there's a, there's a lot there. I, I mean, you yes. summarized that beautifully, but let's <laughs> dive into the details. So okay, let's 1990, go. You're, you're, you said you were in your early 20s, mid-20s at that point? I was 23, yes. 23. I was, mm -hmm. And I had been having symptoms for, you know, six months, a year before I was finally diagnosed. And, um, yeah. and it was a long route after that. So let's, let's just put that out there if you're comfortable with it. When you say symptoms, talk to us a little bit about what it was that you were experiencing. Okay. Honestly, ulcerative colitis is basically bloody diarrhea and severe abdominal pain, mostly left lower quadrant for me, a lot of urgency, and just using the restroom 10, 20, 30 times a day. And in your mid, early 20s, 23, I, I, was can't 23. I cannot imagine that that was anything that you were expecting. It was not. I had never known anyone with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, no one in my family, and I actually didn't even know anyone who had the disease. Um, but I ended up going to, a, I went to a GI doctor and they told me I had irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I was actually in medical school at the time. So I went to the library and I looked up irritable bowel syndrome and it said you shouldn't have blood. So I knew that was incorrect. So I went back and had a scope and I was um, diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. What ran through your head the first time you had a flare up? I would think that that would scare, I mean, pardon the pun, it would scare the crap out of me. What was yeah. that like for you? You know, when it first started, I would have symptoms four or five days and it would get back to normal. And I kept thinking, did I eat something? Um, you know, it was like on and off for about a year. But at the very end, when I was finally diagnosed, I weighed um, under 100 pounds, uh, you know, 10 pounds lighter than I am now, maybe. And um, I had just very weak, a lot of pain. Um, I couldn't eat. So I learned that even before I was diagnosed, I learned that when I ate, it really made me use the restroom. And so I would just not eat all day and then only eat at night. And then I would only drink during the day, you know, water. And then I would, could only eat at night Did that because help my you? symptoms would be brought on. It's, okay. So only eating at night though, even though that was just once a day, would your symptoms be triggered by that one meal? No, I seem to have, mo personally, I seem to have most of my symptoms in the morning. So I realized that if I didn't eat all day after that, I seemed to be okay or better at least. So I could function during the day. Yeah. And I would and imagine like being 23, that's probably also not a struggle that you would be really keen to share with your friends, right? No, I was horrified to tell you the truth, especially after I was diagnosed, you know, for I have this diagnosis, I was worried is am I going to be able to get married, have children? I mean, it was definitely a thought in my mind. Um, after that, am I going to be able to have a career? So mm. all those things you know, were right. going through my mind. And I didn't tell anyone. I think I told like one of my friends, girlfriends, I just, I was embarrassed. It's, a, it's embarrassing. They are embarrassing symptoms to have. So it's not something um, that you want to talk about. And I think things have changed. You know, now everyone talks about mental health and their illness. Everyone's very open. But back in 1990, you know, it was before the internet. And I think people weren't very open about things. No, 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 uh, definitely not. Not not a, that day and age. And I think even though by and large as a society, we've made a lot of progress as far as being more open and accepting of certain things. But 
I would think even today's 23 year old might struggle with, Hey, everybody, I've got ulcerative colitis. You know, it's right. not exactly something they would be tweeting or putting up on their Instagram or TikTok. Right. You know, it's, it's not exactly the most fun topic. Right. Um, so Definitely. what kind of foods were you eating at this point? Were you eating that standard Western American diet? Um, no, you know, I've never been a big standard American diet. Um, my, I was, you know, I feel like my mom uh, taught me to be relatively healthy, but I still ate a lot of milk products. I mean, I didn't eat fast food. I was never a fast food person. I did eat a lot of vegetables, but I ate a lot of cheese. Um, during this time, I realized like I had a lot of grilled cheese sandwiches. Just cheese sandwiches seemed to just, you know, be what I needed. So I, um, but no, I was never the standard American McDonald's type of person. Um, I thought I ate relatively, I thought at that time I was eating relatively healthy. How's that? Uh, th that I mean, it, it sounds like, I mean, if I were you, I mean, pre, you know, uh, plant-based nutrition knowledge here, uh, I would think the same thing as you did. I mean, what you described is not in all honesty, the worst diet that I've ever heard right. in my entire life. Right. So like for me, I was eating 10,000 calories of fast food all day, every day. Yeah. Right. So like, that was my thing. But what you're describing, I mean, it just sounds kind of normal to me. So like, I'm just, why is it that somebody who was in my position didn't get that? And then here you are eating a normal ish diet who is struggling. It doesn't exactly seem fair to me. Well, I have some theories. I do think, um, if you want to hear my theories, I do oh, think ultra class is genetic. Um, in some ways they've died, they found 118 or so genes I've read. So I do think it is genetic, but I think there's something in the environment that triggers it. And, um, my personal theory right now, if you would like to know is, um, there's something called MAP, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis. And they're a physician in, uh, London or a group in London, and they're called the Crohn's MAP vaccine. And they think that there's a small mycobacterium and it causes yoni's disease in cows and that's like a crohn's disease in cows so i personally think it's all over our environment and i think it's in meat and dairy but i do think the plant-based diet um it, you're a eliminating the meat and dairy and b you're improving your microbiome to make your your gut bacteria healthier so i, I do think it's a combo i mean i do think there is maybe something out there causing this yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know much about what it was that you described. I mean, we can certainly try to delve a little bit deeper <laughs> in there for you. Um, like... But um, let me let me ask you this. What course of action was prescribed by your doctor at that point? OK, so when I first was diagnosed, I was put on sulfasalicine, which is a common drug with sulfa in it. It's you know a basic drug. There were no biologics like Humira and Remicade back then. So I actually had an allergic reaction to that. And so then I was put on a trial study for mesalamine. Um, it was Asacol when it came out. Um, I was living in Kansas City and I was on that drug for about a year with steroids and I did pretty well. Um, and then I moved to St. Louis for my residency. So I went off the study and I had a pretty bad first year. All my symptoms came back. So that medication was actually helpful for me. And I stayed on that medication, which was Asacol um, for, 25 years. I did have a lot of breakthroughs. So um, I learned that for me, they recommend four to six tablets a day. I learned that for me, I needed 12 to just be stable. So I would take 12 a day. I would tell them I was taking that much. And then if I felt a flare coming on, started having symptoms, I would start popping 20, 24 a day. Um, and sometimes that would keep me out of a flare. And sometimes I would have a flare up. And um, when I would have a flare up, um, these symptoms would last weeks and just get worse and worse. And I would usually then take, um, as soon as I could, I would take a course of steroids, um, which was a tapering dose over four to six weeks. And sometimes after that, I would have to restart again, that course of steroids if my symptoms came back. So even though I was, I would say I was relatively controlled for 25 years with medication. Um, I was hospitalized a few times. Um, I did terrible during both my pregnancies because I went off my medication. Um, but I, I feel like I was well controlled, but I was always on the verge, always on the verge of like having something bad happen. I would travel with pills and always nervous about, um, you know, when a flare would start again. 
How frustrating was that for you, even though you were able to manage it as best as you could, being a doctor, right? And doctors want to search for the cure. Um, and for you, it just wasn't happening. I mean, you were just saying you were taking sometimes two dozen pills a day just to manage this. And, and you're in your residency. And obviously, you know, medicine and still, still you're struggling with this. That must have been the most frustrating thing in the world. It was frustrating. It was frustrating. But I always felt like um, I always had a goal that I wanted to just, for instance, the ultrasound tech where I was doing my residency, she had ulcerative colitis and worked. She was in her 50s. And I always thought, I want to be like her. I want to be able to have a life and work and have a family. And that was just really important to me. So it was frustrating, but I think I always had a goal. And when I had someone to look up to, even though I never told her because I didn't want to tell her I had ulcerative colitis too, but she was open about it. I always felt like I had a role model and I always felt there was, I think I had a lot of hope. Did you pick her brain? Like what, what are you eating today? What's your diet like? No, because this is the crazy thing. No one has ever, ever told me or told, you know, they just give you medication. I'm not, trying no one ever said what i would eat would have any effect on my ulcerative colitis they usually would say don't eat a lot of fiber when you're going through a flare so go do a low fiber diet but not one person ever mentioned diet so in about 2007 i was having multiple flares and i went on azathioprine and i actually had a mild pancreatitis so it's a medication um and and that was when I started searching the internet and I came across the, um, it's called the, um, I'm blanking on the name, the um, carbohydrate specific diet. You can edit that. Carbohydrate specific diet. And that's a low carb diet. And then I also um, came across being gluten free. So I have been actually gluten free since 2007, but I try the carbohydrate specific diet, which is where you eliminate, you know, white carbohydrates. So white rice potatoes, but you can, and then that also eliminates, and white flour, so it also eliminates all um, cookies, cakes, you know, all processed foods. And I would do better, but I was still having um, flare-ups. So I, you know, didn't really stay on that, but that eliminates um, fruit mm. for, you know, and so it's a published, um, it's in out in the internet that it helps a lot of people. Um, I and then I went gluten free in 2007, as I say. So no one ever mentioned that was on my own research. No one ever in all the years and I go in all the time has ever mentioned anything about diet to me. And I don't know why I wasn't even really searching except, you know, at that point for changes. But then it seemed like, OK, if this is food going through, you know, my body, then food must have some effect on my colon. Um, but so. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. So like now some pieces are starting to fall into place for you. Um, even though nobody has mentioned nutrition, uh, being a component here, um, the light bulb just seems like you're describing the light bulb just kind of goes off one day. How did you stumble across the idea of, well, maybe, maybe if we took meat out of the diet, maybe if we took dairy out of the diet, maybe if we gravitated toward a plant-based diet, I might find some relief there. No, I didn't do that. I will tell you my story. I was going on vacation and I like to read on a Kindle. So I was looking for some books and I came across Dr. Greger's How Not to Die. And I read How Not to Die on the plane. And it intrigued me. It had nothing to do with my ulcerative colitis because with ulcerative colitis, you have an increased risk of colon cancer. And my dad had Parkinson's, my mom's dad had Parkinson's. And I really read that book immediately I just became intrigued. Then I read the China study and then um, I read Eat to Live. I watched, um, right after that, I watched Forks Over Knives, What the Health. Since then I've watched Game Changers. And I, like within that week, like literally, so literally I just thought this makes sense to me for a health reason. I wasn't even thinking about my ulcerative colitis. I stopped my Diet Coke immediately. I never had another Diet Coke and I was a, uh, minimum of four cans a day Diet Coke. Mm -hmm. um, I never had another piece of meat or fish. I stopped dairy immediately. And so within a week, I did this based on this book. I'm, I guess you could say I was extreme for my husband. But um, and then so I just did it for my health. And it just seemed also real. Um, T. Colin Campbell talking about how increased 
you know, meat was causing increased cancer. And it all just made sense to me about eating, you know, everything you eat, in my opinion, has, uh, which I learned has phytonutrients. And so when you're eating, you're just, it's not just for the vitamin C in your orange, it's filled with so many phytonutrients we don't, that we don't even know. So it became just something I wanted to do for my own health. And then I noticed, and I, I was just thinking back, I don't remember when I went off my medicine, but I started noticing I would never have like the symptoms that a flare was going to start. It just never happened. And so then I said, I'm just going to stop taking my medicine and see what happens. And I have been off, you know, so that was five years ago. So I don't know how long I waited. I would say it was less than six months, but I, I just don't even know to tell you the truth. So I haven't taken one pill since that time. Wow. Wow. So you, you just kind of lucked into this. Um, yes, completely lucked into it. I didn't do it for the ulcerative class. I That wasn't even ever on my mind because in his book, well, I don't remember him talking about it. It was more for the cancer, heart disease, diabetes. I thought, I, I want to live a long time and I want to be healthy. I've always been the same weight. It was never, I didn't actually lose any weight on this diet or gain, or I call it a lifestyle, not a diet. Um, because people think when you call it a diet that you're trying to lose weight. So I call it my lifestyle. Um, <laughs> but I never, um, eh, well, anyway. <laughs> I got you. I got you. So, you, I mean, you, you've made a lot of improvements. So the thing that kind of makes me laugh, though, is that when you would have flare ups previously, uh, you were told to eat a diet that was very low in fiber. And then obviously right. a plant based diet. I mean, it is a fiber bomb yes. and you're yes. still not having any issues. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Yes. I think, I mean, I've learned so much, but I think just eating so many different foods and legumes and nuts just increases the fiber that your bacteria in your gut likes to eat. And it increases the good bacteria and decreases the bad bacteria. And they have been, um, there have been studies that show that people with Crohn's and colitis have um, a, 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 a abnormal bacteria load as compared to healthy people. And that we have a lot of a lower, we have a lot of bad bacteria and normal people have more high, uh, good bacteria. Uh, you know, I'm kind of wondering here, um, I, because you're, you're so, you seem so healthy now and you haven't had any of these issues. Like, have you gone back and spoken with your own doctor who was helping you kind of manage this and was giving you your prescriptions? And I, I would just love to know what their thought yeah. is. So my, I went to my regular internist and I told her, and she was super intrigued. And she started right at the same time, she started helping her patients. Most of her patients, she said, were diabetic. Um, she was advertising. It was actually on her, like when she would give you handouts at the end, it was saying, eat less meat, eat more fruits and vegetables. But I, I feel like I want to tell everyone. I mean, it's been so amazing for me. And I, oh, I forgot to tell you, my daughter has Crohn's disease. So that's another thing. So my daughter was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in her senior year of high school. And this was prior to me going plant-based also. She went vegetarian almost right around that same time because we went on vacation and went fishing and she saw some things happen to the fish. So she went, um, she went vegan or she went vegetarian for animals. And I actually started after her, but she is also on no medication and has no symptoms. Oh man, that's man. Okay. And uh, wow, that's amazing. So there's yes. that genetic component, but it goes back to conversations that we've had on the show where even if you inherit a certain genetic marker, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will get whatever disease that marker is for. In right. this case, it right. would be Crohn's disease because you're not doing anything that would basically cause that switch to flip up and say, hey, right. here's your Crohn's symptoms. Um, right. I'm curious, sometimes when a person will go hardcore with a, a whole food plant-based diet overnight after eating that standard diet for so long, um, there is a little bit of gastrointestinal upset in there. Um, for my wife and I, there was a lot of gas and bloating, maybe even mm -hmm. some cramping there. It was kind of like a, an interesting couple of weeks, um, uh -huh. but then it subsided. But you who was coming into this with a lot of issues to begin with, what was that transition like for you? Were there any of those symptoms? 
I don't remember. You know, that's, I don't, I didn't have many gastrointestinal symptoms, or if I did, they were a lot less than what I had been going through before. I, you know, lived with left lower quadrant pain. I mean, I just always felt like I was in pain if I was going to have a flare up. So this, if I did have uncomfortableness, it was probably a lot less than what I was having before, because I don't really have any, you know, memory of that being <laughs> so an uncomfortable you, time. Give us an idea of what your diet is like today. Um, so you want to like a day? Well, I mostly eat just fresh fruits, vegetables, a lot of um, beans. I make my own hummus every, usually every weekend. Um, a lot of potatoes. I like the purple Stokes potatoes, nuts, seeds, uh, quinoa, black rice. So basically just all natural foods. I do the no oil. Um, so it's whole food, plant-based, no oil. I try to do no salt. Don't really add that much salt. I don't, I am not a low fat person. So I will put like in my hummus, I put tahini and I'll eat peanut butter. I eat a lot of nuts, but I just don't eat. I don't add oil when I'm cooking. You can use vegetable broth or peanut butter. It, so personally, how I'm feeling about whole food plant-based is everything we put in our mouth, it's an opportunity to eat phytonutrients. It's an opportunity to nourish our body. And so when you're using oil, you're using these calories that actually don't have nutrition. And so it's okay to use peanut butter in your rice if you want it to have, or you, so I do things like that. You can use cashew butter, you can put things in your food if you want it to have a different taste or you need oil for cooking, but I just don't use oil. Did you say peanut butter in your rice? Yeah. So it makes it, I, you, you can put peanut butter in your rice and then, and it's like a sesame peanut. Um, you can have vegetables. It's like a sesame peanut Asian dish. Oh, I've it tastes of... really good. Like, you yeah. know, you can put tofu in it and I do eat a lot of tofu too. in tempeh. I usually, um, I, I will make four pounds of tofu. I cut it, spice it, bake it, and then put it in plastic bags in my freezer and add it to my lunch when I need it. Yeah, I've, right. heard, I've heard of um, something similar with, with uh, sesame butter uh, using uh, noodles, and that's kind of an Asian thing, a cold sesame noodle dish. And right. that's delicious. But now you're applying that to rice. And I'm like, I think I know what's for dinner tonight. Like yeah. that, that just sounds amazing to me. And I love your philosophy also about making sure that every calorie, you know, has a purpose, essentially. That's the right. way that I interpreted what it was that you said. Um, because right. there are nutrients right. that come with peanut butter that you won't find in any sort of oil. So right. um, that's that's pretty cool as well. Um, give us an example, though. It would, like, walk me through what you have had today, except for the peanut butter rice. I don't know if you've <laughs> had that today or not, but not I yet. think that really the viewers, the listeners, the exam roomies um, are going to be curious. Like, okay, well, give us the exact menu. What was for breakfast? What okay. was for lunch? So I am a grazer and I was off work today. So I start my day with two Brazil nuts because they have selenium in them. And I try to get my daily selenium as well as raisins. And I had an apple and I do drink coffee with almond milk. So it was my breakfast. Um, for lunch, I made a big bowl of, um, I put black rice with multiple vegetables, edamame. I keep, as I said, my tofu in the refrigerator, in the freezer. And then I add that, I cook that in the microwave. So lots of vegetables and rice. And then I add my homemade um, hummus on top. Talk to us about that hummus recipe. Is there, I know you said that there's some tahini in there. You throw some uh, lemon juice in there. Does it have some yeah. zest? So what I do is I, hummus was what got me off of cheese. I ate so much cheese. So even though I was not a big meat eater, I, I ate vegetables, but I would pour Parmesan cheese on my vegetables. I I ate more cheese than probably most people do. And, and so I put cheese on my salad, cheese on everything. And so I thought, how am I gonna, how am I going to not eat cheese? So I started making hummus and I just put hummus on everything and it could be, you know, it lightens up your salad. You can put it on your vegetables. So I just make, it's about three. You can make your, I also, I cook everything as much as I can. I buy everything organic. Um, I also think just me personally that, um, Roundup and everything you're putting on your food can't be good for you. So I try, you know, if everything, I try, you know, I'm probably 80% organic in my home. I, to me, it's worth it to spend money on that. Just that's how I feel. You know, I'm not eating a steak, so I'm going to buy organic everything. 
There you go. I'm not mm -hmm. eating steak, so I'm going to buy organic everything. That should yes. be a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but so, so my hummus recipe, do you want to know it? It's just oh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, do, yeah. I just add about, um, sometimes I make the um, chickpeas in my Instapot and sometimes I'll use canned. So it's about three cups of, um, three cups of chickpeas along with the, the juice it's in if you make them in your Instapot. And then I just add like four tablespoons of tahini. I don't really have a recipe. I uh, squeeze a lemon and I add, oh, this is another thing. So I add turmeric, smoked paprika, garlic, onion, pepper. So another thing I did once I became whole food plant-based is I use so many spices because I also feel somewhat that spices are also full of phytonutrients. So I put, um, you know, I even when I go on vacation, I take my shakers of smoked paprika and uh, turmeric with me. But I use anything you can put on cinnamon. They say there are medicinal values in everything, and I feel like it can't hurt you. So I am a big believer in a lot of different spices. That sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty daggone good. I like the idea of taking spices with you too. Um, yes. especially, I mean, you, you got the big one in there, you got turmeric in there. So, yeah. um, I, I think that you're good to go. Um, you mentioned that your daughter now, uh, gravitated toward vegetarian, uh, vegetarianism, uh, mm -hmm. anyone else in your family taking meat and dairy off of the table? Yeah. So my daughter is 25 and she, she did it because of her Crohn's and she's healthy. And then my son, I believe it was in about 2018 or 19. He also became whole food plant-based. He's probably 90% when he goes out to dinner with friends or, you know, whole, whole order um, a regular meal. But he did it, he said, because he studied abroad in Hong Kong and he noticed he didn't, he had the, you know, he said he never knew what actually type of meat he was eating, which made him nervous. And so he noticed that when he went um, plant-based that he had, you know, teenage acne, his acne disappeared. And he, so he, he said he did it to clear up his face. He stopped all milk products and meat for the most part. And I think he saw me doing it at home also. So now he's great. He'll text me pictures. He, he lives in an apartment downtown, but he'll text me pictures. I thought you'd like to know what I'm having for lunch. And he'll make a big, you know, plate of just whole food, plant-based foods. So He's also into it. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. And I guess my final question for you is this. You mentioned that you kind of had this woman who you looked up to um, when you were a young uh, doctor uh, who had ulcerative colitis. Has it dawned on you that you may now be that inspiration for someone else? It has. Actually, originally when my daughter was diagnosed, I told her, I would like you to go to meetings to find a role model. Someone, you know, will help you. Like, this woman helped me and she said, mom, you're my role model. So uh -huh. since then I have actually been, that's when I actually became much more open about my ulcerative colitis because I feel like I can help people. I have um, a friend at work, her um, daughter was diagnosed and I'm very open. I just started talking to people about it. I never even told people I worked with that I had this um, because it was just something I didn't really want to be how I was defined. Right. I wanted to be defined as who I was and not this disease. So I, I personally wasn't, you know, didn't talk to people much about it, but yes, I would like now for everyone. I mean, I just realized, you know, I think you may have asked me or people ask me, is it hard? Do you need willpower? And I need no willpower to do this because I feel like a, I feel healthy. So it feels enjoyable. Every time I eat, I sometimes think, ah, oh, this is so nourishing. I'm helping my body. And I really do think that. And I feel like we should all have more nutrition courses, whether it's in high school or, you know, college, medical school. I think it's something that's really undervalued um, in all schools. No doubt about it. And I mean, the fact of the matter is this. I mean, you look great. You sound like you're feeling great, uh, haven't had a flare up and gosh, only knows how long. And now you're, you're leading the way for your daughter and plenty of others as well. And now with thousands of people uh, listening and watching the show today. So I think you are well on your way to doing something quite spectacular, Debbie, quite spectacular indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope if I can just help one or two people, I'm happy, but the more I can help, the better. I think it's such an easy thing to try it and see if it could work for you. I think you're going to help out more than one or two today. <laughs> Just a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Debbie. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate it. 
If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.